today, you will learn grammatical structure. Students find it difficult. It shouldn't be. Sometimes when you see questions on grammatical names and function in exams, you become jittery. Today, we want to make things easy for you. If you pay attention, if you follow our procedures, you'll find out that this topic is very easy. I advise you, pay close attention. I'll start with phrases and clauses, the difference between the phrase and the clause. From there, I'll move on to how to identify the grammatical name of an underlined expression. I repeat, I'll move on to how to identify the grammatical name of an what? Expression, an underlined expression. Take note of that. Then, we'll go on to the functions. The functions of each of the grammatical names, whether noun phrases, noun clauses, adverbials, and adjectives. I advise you, pay close attention. First, a phrase and a clause. What is a phrase? A phrase is a group of words which does not have a finite verb. A phrase is a group of words which does not have a finite verb, while a clause is a group of words which has a subject and a finite verb. I'll repeat again. I'll repeat the sentences again. A phrase is a group of words which does not have a finite verb. A clause is a group of words which has a finite verb and a subject. I will use the definitions I've given to teach. Now, look at the sentences on the board. I've underlined some expressions in each of the sentences. In one, I underlined the young boys in the neighborhood. In two, I underlined in the lobby for a long time. In three, I underlined because I had no money. In four, I underlined whose car was stolen. In five, to achieve academic excellence. In six, studying fire into the night. Don't forget our differentiation, the distinction between a phrase and a clause. You look at number one, the underlined expression, the young boys in the neighborhood. If you look at the expression, there is no verb. It has no verb. So we are going to call that expression a phrase. In two, you look at the expression in the lobby for a long time. The expression has no verb. Therefore, that expression is also a phrase. In three, because I had no money. The expression has a verb. The verb is had. Therefore, the expression will be called a clause. In four, whose car was stolen? Whose car was stolen? The expression has a verb. The verb is was. Therefore, the underlined expression will be called a clause. I stop a little. Stop for a while on number four. Because number five and number six offers us a different approach. When a verb, when a verb has to in front of it, when a verb is preceded by the word to, that verb is no longer a finite verb. Remember, we said a clause is a group of words which has a finite verb. In number five, there seems to be a verb there. There seems to be a verb, and the verb is achieve. But achieve is preceded by to. Since it is preceded by to, Achieve is no longer a finite verb, it's an infinitive. Therefore, the underlined expression to achieve academic excellence cannot be regarded as a clause. It is a phrase. Once again, the underlined expression to achieve academic excellence is a phrase, not a clause, because the verb is preceded by to. In number six, 
The expression on the land is studying far into the night. Studying far into the night. The word which appears to be a verb is studying. But studying is not a finite verb because it does not have an auxiliary verb attached to it. Therefore, studying will be regarded as a gerund. It is not a finite verb. Therefore, the underlined expression is a phrase, not a clause. Therefore, we have stated this. A phrase has no verb. A phrase has no verb. A clause has a verb. A phrase has no verb. A clause has a verb. Someone just asked an excellent question. What's the difference between a finite verb and a non-finite verb? Good question. I will use some of the expressions on the board to illustrate the difference. A finite verb, a finite verb should have a subject, a tense, and a number. Once again, a finite verb should have a subject, a tense, and a number. Now let's use number three, because I had no money. The verb is had. We want to find out whether it is finite or non-finite. I've said a finite verb should have a subject, a number, and a tense. Subject. The subject of had there is had. Tense. There are three tenses. Present, past, and future. If you look at the word had, it is obviously in the past tense. And it should have a number. Is the subject singular or plural? Here it is assumed that high should be what? Singular because it's the first person singular. So the three qualities of a finite verb are present in this expression because I have no money. The tense is past, the subject is high, and the number is singular. If it is a non-finite verb, a non-finite verb would not have a subject, would not have a tense, would not have a number. Let's use number five as an example. Just this expression, to achieve academic excellence. The verb here is achieve. What's the subject? Nobody knows. What's the tense? Not explicit. This is not, this not present tense. This in the infinitive. What's the number? Nobody knows. So number five is a non-finite verb. The same thing applies to number six. The verb is what? Studying. Don't look at what comes before this word studying. Look at only the word studying. Who's studying? Not expressed in the underlying expression. So it has no subject. It has no tense. We don't know whether it is present or past. At the same time, we don't know whether it is singular or plural. Therefore, the difference between finite verb and non-finite is in the qualities possessed by the word finite verb. The finite verb will have a subject, tense, and number. The non-finite verb will not have any of those qualities. We have differentiated between the phrase and the clause. We have established that a phrase does not have a finite verb, a clause has a finite verb. So we want to move on to the next step, which is identifying the grammatical name of the underlined expression. Look at the board. Let's say you are given these expressions, the underlined ones. How do you come up with the grammatical names of those underlined expressions? Remember, you should choose from any of the following six grammatical names. And they are noun phrase, noun clause, adjective phrase, adjective clause, adverbial phrase, adverbial clause. Any of the six are the possible answers to questions in external and sometimes internal what exams. 
How do you identify the grammatical name? There is a group of words regarded as structural words. These structural words indicate the grammatical name of an underlined expression. Now look towards the right of the board. You will find listed some words described as structural words. Don't forget, I said structural words indicate the grammatical name of an expression. As a student, you look at the expression. What is the first word in the underlined expression? The first word in the online, underlined expression will indicate the grammatical name of that expression. Once again, find out the first word in the underlined expression. The first word in the underlined expression will indicate the grammatical name of that expression. Look at number one. The student in my class is the underlying expression. What's the first word in the underlying expression? The first word is the. The first word is the. Look at the table towards the right. You'll find written there, determinants. The first word under determinants is the. Anytime an expression starts with the, most of the time, that expression will be a noun. A noun. Either a noun phrase or a noun clause. Noun phrase or a noun clause. Remember the distinction between phrase and clause. N number one, look at the expression. Is it a phrase or a clause? Does it have a finite verb or not? Number one does not have a finite verb. Therefore, it is a phrase. The first word is the. The comes under the noun. Therefore, the expression is a noun phrase. Now, you look at number two. Apply the same steps. Step one. Is the expression a phrase or a clause? Step one. If you look closely, a lot of people who live in the rural areas. A lot of people who live in the rural areas. There's a verb in the expression. The verb is live. Therefore, the underlined expression is a clause. What type of clause now? If you look at the table there, the table in the table you have a. A lot is there. Therefore, it will be a noun clause. A noun clause because of the verb live. In number three, the expression is which are noisy. Which are noisy. Is it a phrase or a clause? It is a clause. The verb is a, and it is finite. The expression, the underlined expression starts with which, which comes under relative clause or adjective. If an expression begins with which, it will definitely be an adjective clause, or you can call it a relative clause. Look at number four. What he told me. Is it a phrase or a clause? The answer is clause. What type of clause? The first word is what. What is under conjunction here and is under noun. Therefore, the whole expression is a noun clause. In five, the expression is that I bought. That I bought. Is, there, is it a phrase or a clause? It's a clause because of the presence of the verb bought. It starts with that. Look at the board. That is under the conjunction. These conjunctions. That can be a noun. Therefore, the answer to this one is noun clause. Number six. Number six. The expression is that he bought some books. That he bought some books. That is a verb there. Therefore, the expression is a clause. It starts with that. Starts with that. Since it's that, it's going to be uh, a noun clause, not an adjective clause in this case. Look at numbers five and six. The two underlined expressions start with that. In number five, that I bought is a clause. 
it has a finite verb, but. The expression starts with that. Since it starts with that, it is going to be an adjectival clause, or you call it a relative clause. Six, he said that he bought some books. That he bought some books. That he bought some books is a clause. It begins with that. But in this case, it will be a noun clause, not an adjective clause. Very good question. Somebody just asked me, how do we know when that will indicate an adjective or a noun? Look at number five. Look at number five. In number five, we can replace the word that with which and the sentence will be grammatical. The sentence will make sense. Let's try it and read it together. The books which I bought have been stolen. Perfect. The books which I bought have been stolen. Perfect. If you try it with number six, you replace the word that with which or who. The sentence will not be grammatical. The sentence will not make any sense. In six, let's try it. He said which he bought some books. No sense. Not grammatical. Therefore, when it is a noun clause, you cannot replace that with either which or who. But if it's an adjectival clause, you can replace that with which or who. And the sentence will be grammatical. We come in with the adverbials. As students of English, you will know that there are about eight types of adverbials. Adverbial of time, place, reason, purpose, concession, condition, result, and manner. We will introduce them. We will show you the table, the structural words which introduce the adverbs. And it will be much easier to identify all the adverbs. Afterwards, we will move to identifying the functions of each of the types of phrases and clauses. Earlier on, we mentioned the adverbials. We said there are eight of them. The eight of them are represented on the board with their structural words. Words that introduce them. We said... We have adverbs of time. What's an adverb of time? An adverb of time will indicate when an action was performed. When. So an adverb of time will answer the question, when. When. I left. I left the school before the rain started. There in that sentence, there is an adverbial of time. What's the adverb here? Before the rain started. Before the rain started. Adverb of places. Adverb of place will tell us where an action was performed. Where? That's why it is said. Adverb of place answers answer the question when. When? When? I sat in the class. I sat in the class. Where did I sit? In the class. That's an adverbial of place. Adverb of reason will answer the question, why? Why was the action taken? Why was the action done? The boy fled because the police were approaching. In the sentence, why did the boy flee? The answer will be what? Because the police were approaching. So the expression because the police were approaching is an adverbial of reason. Adverbial of purpose will answer the question for what purpose was it done? I went to the market so that I could buy some grocery. The expression so that I could buy some grocery is an adverbial of purpose. Students, you can change that expression. 
using any of these conjunctions so as to, in order to, for example, I can say this, I went to the market so as to buy some grocery. I went to the market in order to buy some grocery. I went to the market to buy some grocery. It's still the same expression. Adverbial of manner. The adverbial of manner answers the question, how? How was the action performed? How was the action performed? It works as if. It worked as if he was drunk. The expression as if he was drunk is an adverbial of manner. Adverbial of concession will state the concession given to something. It normally starts with expression words like though, although, despite, in spite of, and whereas. For example, the sentence, though he is rich, he loves the poor. Though he is rich, he loves the poor. The expression though he is rich is an adverbial of concession. Adverbial of results states the results of an action. For example, you can say, he was so tall that he bent to enter the room. He was so tall that he bent to enter the room. The expression, um, so tall that he bent to enter the room is an adverbial of result. The last one is an adverbial of condition. It normally starts with words like if, provided, till, until, unless. An example is, if it rains, I will be wet. I will be wet if the condition of raining is fulfilled. If it rains, it's an adverbial of condition. I would not leave unless you give me my money. I will not leave unless you give me my money. Unless you give me my money there is an adverbial of condition. Now you can see that it's easier to identify the adverbials following the structural words. You want to identify the grammatical name? Look out for these structural words. They will tell you whether the expression is an adverbial or not. Now we've established the adverbials, the nouns, and the adjectives. I want to find out the grammatical names of each of the expressions on the board. Look at them closely. Take two steps. The first step, look at the underlined expression. Is it a phrase or a clause? The second step, look at the first word in the underlined expression. It will tell you the grammatical name. Two steps. And that's all, you have to, that's all you have to take. Two steps. The first, is it a phrase or a clause? The second, the first word in the underlined, underlined expression will indicate the grammatical name. Look at number one. Number one, the expression is in low tones. In low tones. Phrase or clause? Phrase. No verb. The first word in the underlined expression is in. In, in, if you look at the structural words, structural words, in or called under adverbs. In this case, this one will be regarded as an adverbial phrase. Can someone tell me the type of adverbial? Yes, it will be an adverbial of manner. How did we talk about the matter? in lower tones. Here I must point out something. It is not compulsory for you to write the type of adverbial. Your business is adverbial phrase or adverbial clause. Don't write the type of adverbial. Just mention, indicate whether that is an adverbial phrase or an adverbial clause. Number two. The expression is, if they had gone on that lorry. If they had gone on that lorry. Phrase or clause. It's a phrase. It's a clause. Because it has a finite verb. And the finite verb is, had gone. What's the first word in the underlying expression? That's if. If comes under adverbial of condition. And you will agree with me 
They said it's stating a condition. What's the condition? If they had gone on that lorry, they would have missed the train. So this one is an adverbial clause. Number three, the expression is those friends of yours. Phrase or clause first? Phrase, no verb. What's the first word in the underlined, underlined expression? Those. Since it is those, those are called under nouns. So this expression is a noun phrase. Number four, we stopped where we could get some food. Clause or phrase? Clause. Could get finite verb. The first word, where. Where is an adverbial of place. So this one is an adverbial clause. Number five, a candidate in an examination hall. Look at the expression. Phrase or clause? Phrase. No verb. What's the first word? A. Since this A, it occurred under nouns. This expression is a noun phrase. Six. In spite of his wealth. Phrase or clause? No verb. Phrase. It starts with in spite of. If you check the table, in spite of occurred under adverbial of concession. So, this is an adverbial phrase. Having understood how to identify the grammatical name of an expression, we'll take it a little step further and identify the functions of the grammatical structures. Whenever an expression is a noun, what function will it be performing? Whenever an expression is an adverbial, what function will it be performing? If it's an adjectival, what function will, be, will it be performing? For nouns, we'll talk more about that. We have learned how to identify the grammatical names of expressions. We've learned. We've learned how to identify the grammatical names of expressions. Now I want to learn the functions of each of the grammatical names. If an expression is a noun phrase or a noun clause, what are the possible functions? The possible functions are one, subject of the verb. Don't ever write subject of the sentence. It may not be accepted. The possible answer, if an expression is a noun phrase or noun clause, it can function as subject of the verb. A noun phrase or noun clause is regarded as subject of the verb if the noun phrase or noun clause does the action. Look at the sentence on the board. The boys kicked the balls. The boys kicked the balls. The boys is a noun phrase. The boys is a noun phrase. What's the function? The boys are the one that did the action of what? Kicking. Kicked. Therefore, this expression is serving as the subject of the verb kicked. If I want to write the function, I will say noun phrase function. It is the subject of the verb kicked. The second function of a noun phrase or noun clause is object of the verb. Object of the verb. A noun phrase or noun clause will be the object of the verb if it is serving as the receiver of the action. Serving as the receiver of the action. The one on whom the action is done. Look at the sentence. This sentence is a repeat of sentence one here. The boys kick the ball. What did the boys kick? The subject acted on what? The ball. Here, the ball is acting as object of the verb kicked. So, noun phrase, function, it is the object of the verb kicked. Take note of that. I have used a structural representation. Look at the board for number one. I said if the noun phrase or noun clause is coming before a verb, noun phrase or noun clause coming before a verb, it will be what? Subject of the verb. Subject of the verb. Like this. Noun phrase before this verb. This one will be regarded as subject of this. Look at this. Number two. 
if the noun phrase or noun clause is coming after the verb, after the verb, like this, the ball, noun phrase, coming after the verb kicked, when you want to state the function, it will be object of the verb, not subject of the verb. Take note of that. Number three, the third function, complement of the verb. Look at the word complement, the way it is spelt. Don't make the mistake of writing C-O-M-P-L-I. It is not P-L-I, it should be P-L-E. Complement of the verb to complete the sentence. A noun phrase or a noun clause will be regarded as complement of the verb if it, it is coming. If that noun phrase or noun clause is coming directly, immediately after the forms of the verb to be. What are the verbs to be? Is, an, a, was, were, been, and so on and so forth. And look at the sentence below. It was what I actually wanted. This expression, what I actually wanted, is a noun clause. But look at the noun clause. It's coming immediately after the verb was, which is the form of a form of the verb to be. Therefore, this noun clause expression will be acting as complement of the verb. When you want to write the function, you write, it is the complement of the verb was. Number four, complement or object of the preposition. Complement or object of the preposition. A noun phrase or noun clause can serve as a complement or object of a preposition if it comes. If it comes. That's if the noun phrase or noun clause comes immediately after a preposition. You should know what prepositions are. Words like to, in, on, at, and so on and so forth. Look at this expression. The books were left on the shelf. The shelf is underlined. That's a noun phrase. And what's the function? It is the complement of the preposition on. Or you can call it, it is the object of the preposition on. From here, we move to the adverbials. You've learned the functions of the nouns. Noun phrase and noun clause. Can you remember them? Subject of the verb, object of the verb, complement of the verb, complement or object of the preposition. Now we move to the function of adverbs. If you identify an expression as either an adverbial phrase or adverbial clause, what's the function of the adverb? Look at the sentence. Number one, when he got back home, he found everything messed up. The expression, when he got back home, is an adverbial clause. What's the function? The function will be, it modifies the verb found. Take note of this. When you are referring to the verb being modified by the adverb, don't, don't pick any verb from the underlined expression. You can see, I did not write got. I wrote what? Found. It modifies the verb found. That's the verb in the main clause. Look at number two. They talked in low tones. The expression in low tones is an adverbial phrase. What's the function now? It modifies the verb talked. That's the function of an adverb. If it's an adjective, look at the sentences below. Lorries which are noisy should not enter this compound. Which are noisy? An adjectival clause. What's the function? You look at the noun it is referring to. What's the noun it is referring to? What's the noun it is referring to? The noun is lorries. Which lorries? The ones that are noisy. Not the ones that are not noisy. So this is an adjectival clause. What's the function? It qualifies the noun, lorries. Take note. Don't write it qualifies the noun, lorry. What you have here is lorries. Since it is lorries, your answer should be it qualifies the noun, lorries. Number two. The books I bought yesterday are with my father. I bought yesterday. It's an adjectival clause. What's the function now? It will be, it qualifies the noun books. Or you can write, it qualifies the noun phrase, the books. You have seen the structural words. You have seen the items on the structural words. Take note of them. Let's see whether you can apply the knowledge of the structural words to identifying the grammatical names of these expressions. I will lead you. 
Number one, the underlying expression is if I could take them to the zoo. They asked me if I could take them to the zoo. Step one, phrase or clause. Clause. What's the first word in the underlying expression? If. And if you look at the table, if occurred on the noun clause and adverbials. Under the nouns and adverbials. Now, in this case, is the expression a noun or an adverbia? They asked me if I could take them to the zoo. A noun or an adverbia? The answer is noun clause. It's a noun. How do you verify your answer? If an expression is a noun, you can replace the whole expression with a pronoun and the sentence will be grammatical. They asked me something. They ask me it. They ask me something. At the same time, if an expression is a noun, it will be performing the function of a noun. What's the function of this one now? It will be, it is the object of the verb asked. Two ways of identifying whether an expression is a noun. I said, you can replace that expression with a pronoun. That's one. Two, you can ascertain the function if it's a noun. Three, if the expression answers the question, what, it's a noun. What did they ask me? What did they ask me if I could take them to the zoo? Therefore, the expression is a noun. I've told you three ways of establishing whether an expression is a noun or not. Look at number two. If I took them to the zoo, I would be compensated. If I took them to the zoo, it's a clause because of took. What about clause now? Adverbia clause. How do you know whether it's an adverbia? You ask yourself, it's an adverbia. If it is an adverbia, what type of adverbia? What type? In this case, it will be an adverbial of what? Condition. And what will be the function? It modifies the verb. Would be compensated. Number three, I know where he lives. I know where he lives. Clause first. Where is the first? You may be tempted to call this expression an adverbia. It is not an adverbial. It will be a noun. A noun. Now let's apply those three steps. One, you can replace the expression with a pronoun. I know it. I know something. What's the function? It is the object of the verb know. Third one, does it answer the question what? What do I know? Where he lives. Perfect. Now close. Number four, it took me where, it took me where he lived. It took me where he lived. This one is an adverbial clause. How do you know? If you ask the question, where did he take me? Where did he take me? Where he lived. So it answers the question where. The expression is an adverbial clause. So you can see, identifying the grammatical names can be done using what? The structural words and using the functions. When you apply those steps, everything will be easily done. Thank you. Structures of a simple sentence. Structures of a simple sentence. First, what's a simple sentence? A simple sentence has only one main clause. The main clause will have at least a subject and a verb. A subject and a verb. The most important item in a sentence is the verb. It can be the combination of the subject and the predicate. Look at the example here. The students love mathematics. The subject of the sentence is the students. Who loves mathematics? The students. And the verb is love and mathematics. Mathematics is the complement. Everything that comes after the students becomes the predicate. 
the predicate can be further broken down, can be analyzed into V, which is verb, that is the action word. Then O, object, that's the receiver of the action, or the person that suffers the action. The complement makes the sentence complete. For example, you say, he is. If you stop there, the sentence is not complete. But if you say, he is a man, a man there makes the subject, makes the sentence complete. A stands for adjunct. Adjunct is another word for adverbias. And you know the types of adverbias, the various types. You have place, time, uh, reason, manner, and so on and so forth. Now, today we are going to learn how to break down a simple sentence, how to analyze a simple sentence. A simple sentence can have just S standing for what? Subject. And V standing for what? A verb. That means the sentence will just be the combination of a subject and a verb. Examples are Shola laughed. The subject is Shola. Laughed is the verb. And look at the next sentence. The man has traveled. The man has traveled. The man is the subject. Has traveled the verb. Now that same, those same sentences can take adjuncts. We will talk about them later. Now look at this one. SVA. S stands for subject. V for verb. A adjunct. And see the sentence. John walked out of the house. John walked out of the house. The subject is John. Walked, the verb, out of the house. That's the word, adjunct, the adverbia. Then the next one, Mr. Johnson teaches in the school. Mr. Johnson is the subject. Teaches, the verb, in the school, adjunct. Now let's see whether we can add... We can change the structures of the these sentences to SVA. SVA. Can anybody try? If you have something like this, he laughed. How? Loudly. It will become what? SVA. Shola, shola, subject, laughed. Verb, loudly, adverb. The adjunct. Let's try the, the second one. The man has traveled. Will become the man has traveled out of the country. The man, subject, has traveled, the verb, out of the country, adjunct. We've seen two structures, SV and SVA. SV, subject, verb, then subject, verb, adjunct. Don't forget, I said adjunct stands for, stands for adverbials. Now, here are some other structures. We have SVC. SVC. SVC stands for subject, verb, and complement. Subject, verb, complement. Look at the sentence on the board. Junior is a, bank, is a banker. Yes. Junior is a banker. Junior is the subject. The verb is is. A banker is the complement. My sister seems happy. My sister, subject, seems. The verb, happy, complement. The next one, SBO. S, as you know, stands for the subject, V, verb, O, object. Examples, Audu won the award. Audu, subject. One, verb. What did Audu win the award? That's the object. That's SVO. The next one, our class teacher lost his wallet. Our class teacher, subject, lost, verb. And the object is his wallet. SVOA stands for subject, verb, object, and adjunct. Examples. Our class teacher took the students home. Good. Our class teacher is the subject. Took the verb. The students. Object. And home is the adverbia. Where did the class teacher take the students home? That's the adverbia. Therefore, it is the adjunct. John bought a car last month. John, subject, bought, verb, a car, object, 
last month showing time that's adjunct sboc subject verb object and complement examples francis called him a thief francis subject called verb him object then a thief is the complement it makes the sentence complete francis called him what a thief that's the complement Look at the second example under SVOC. The class made him class captain. The class, the class, the subject, made, verb, him, object, class captain, the complement. Then we have ASVO, standing for what by now? That will be adjunct, subject, verb, object. Look at the sentence, yesterday I bought a new car. Take note, adverbials or adjuncts are mobile. They can move from the, from the end of the sentence to the beginning of the sentence, or they can be in the middle of the sentence. Yesterday, adjunct, I, subject, verb, bought, a new car, object, that's ASVO. Then the next sentence, last week, he taught the class. Last week will be the adjunct, he, subject, taught, verb, the class object of the verb taught. Now these are other structures of the simple sentence. We have S-V-O-C-A, that's the subject, verb, object, complement and adjunct. Look at the sentences. Shola gave me some money yesterday. Shola, the subject, gave, verb, me, object, some money. The complement, yesterday, the adjunct. The class made a maker class captain last year. The class, subject, made, verb, a maker, object, class captain, the complement, and last year is the adjunct. Don't forget what I said earlier on about the adjunct. I said adjuncts are mobile. We have ASVC, adjunct, subject, verb and complement very soon it will become a graduate very soon the adjunct he subject will become the verb a graduate complement last year he taught the class last year adjunct he subject taught verb the class complement now on your own you can analyze the following sentences this should be like a game to you. You can write the structures, SV, form a sentence on your own. You can use it as a game. It can engage you and help you in forming what? Good sentences, good simple sentences. You can start, you can make the adjunct mobile, bring the adjunct to the beginning, make a sentence with a pattern like this, ASVC. If you can do it, that means you are becoming more mature in the use of what? the language and the sentences on your own. As I said, do the analysis of the sentences on the board.